Tonight, Apple teams up with rival IBM, net neutrality comments crash the FCC website, and Google's smart contact lens may be headed to an eyeball near you. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 129 for Tuesday, July 15th, 2014. This episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by NatureBox. Order great tasting, healthy snacks delivered right to your door. Forget the vending machine and get in shape with healthy, delicious treats like coconut date energy bites. To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. I'm Mike Elgin. Let's get right to the tech feed. Apple and IBM announced a partnership that could drive iOS adoption in the enterprise. The agreement is significant in part because IBM long served as enemy number one for the late Apple co-founder and CEO Steve Jobs. The partnership will drive the use of iPhones and iPads for accessing complex data sets that live in the cloud. IBM's newish, newish enterprise mobile software is called Mobile First, and the partnership will result in an extension of that software called Mobile First for iOS. The companies say they'll create more than 100 industry-specific applications that will run on the iPhone and the iPad, ranging from security to mobile device management products. IBM will also start selling iPhones and iPads to its corporate customers. Apple is already in the enterprise. 82% of smartphones and 73% of tablets currently in use in corporate America are iPhones and iPads, respectively. Microsoft announced job cuts, the biggest in five years. The layoffs may be part of the integration of Nokia's handset unit, which Microsoft recently acquired. The restructuring is expected to be officially announced soon, possibly this week. Recode's sources suggest that details of the cuts are still being decided, but the total job losses could exceed the 5,800 job cuts from IBM's 2009 layoffs. Google plans to license its smart contact lens technology to a Swiss pharmaceutical company called Novartis. The plan is to bring electronically enhanced contact lenses to market within a few years with prototypes planned for early next year. The technology embeds non-invasive sensors, microchips, and other miniaturized electronics into contact lenses for two main applications. The first is glucose monitoring for diabetics. Sensors would measure sugar levels in tear fluid, then transmit the data in real time back to a wireless device. The second application could correct vision to help restore the eye's natural focus. The lenses would be able to detect whether its wearer is looking at something close or far away and make changes to the lenses accordingly. It's like autofocus for the human eye. Well, coming up, Google kills their unpopular real names policy for Google+. And next, I'll chat with MP NPR reporter Elise Hugh about the FCC's comment period on net neutrality, which has now been extended, and I'll tell you why. But first, if you want to get healthier, maybe you should snack more. Why? NatureBox, that's why. NatureBox is a subscription service for healthy snacks with zero trans fats, zero high fructose corn syrup, and nothing artificial. NatureBox sends great tasting snacks right to your door with free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Here's how it works. Click on the continue button to choose between three subscription options, then place your order. Once you're a member, you can select which snacks you'd like in your monthly inbox. You can select by dietary needs, vegan, soy-free, gluten-conscious, lactose-free, nut-free, and non-GMO. And you can also select by taste, savory, sweet, or spicy. The next time you get cranky and hungry and are ready to eat anything, remember NatureBox. Snack guilt-free with coconut date energy bites, Santa Fe's corn sticks, pear praline crunch, and more than 100 other healthy choices. To get 50% off your first box, go to naturebox.com slash twit. Stay full, stay strong. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. We thank NatureBox for their support of Tech News Tonight. Well, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission today pushed back its deadline for public comment on the chairman's net neutrality proposal to Friday, July 18th. That's this Friday. The reason for the extension is that massive traffic to the site by a flood of comments appeared to crash the FCC site and people couldn't get through. The previous deadline was today. Joining us to talk about the FCC's proposal and the public comment period is NPR reporter and Thursday Tech News Today co-anchor Elise Hugh. Welcome, Elise. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Now, Elise, can you briefly frame the story here and summarize the current proposal that the comment has been invited to comment on? What is the proposal exactly? 
Sure. Well, as you know, the FCC has been um, charged with enforcing this idea of net neutrality for a long time. There were rules in place since 2010 that they were working under. But earlier this year, an appeals court struck down the, the way they were reading and enforcing net neutrality or this principle of no prioritization on the Internet, that it's sort of free and equal and that there's no prioritization of traffic on the Internet um, to certain sites or certain providers or certain content companies. Um, now they're trying to rewrite the proposal um, for how they're going to be able to regulate this principle. And um, the proposal that's on the table uh, is quite controversial because of one part of it. Um, there's the current idea would actually allow some internet service providers uh, to strike uh, exclusive content deals with content providers, you know, essentially Comcast, the internet service pro provider, striking a deal with uh, Netflix, a content provider, for example, to charge that content provider extra uh, in order to serve content, Netflix videos in this case, uh, at faster speeds so that there isn't that buffering or the annoying um, lag while you're trying to watch Orange is the New Black or or whatever that is. And so that's highly controversial. It's driven all sorts of backlash to Tom Wheeler, the chairman of the FCC. And as of tonight, 780,000 comments from the public have been filed to the FCC regarding this proposal that's on the table. Hmm. Now, yesterday, most major web-centric tech companies spoke with one voice on the net neutrality issue in the form of a letter from the Internet Association, which, is, of course, is a lobbying group representing Google, Facebook, Twitter, AOL, eBay, a whole bunch of technology companies that everybody's familiar with. Another major voice has been comedian John Oliver, who has been eviscerating cable companies over the issue on his HBO show Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Have the Internet Association or John Oliver had an impact in generating public interest in net neutrality, do you think? Well, we've been waiting for those big companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon to make their statements and, and, and weigh in on this topic for a while. They weighed in yesterday through their lobbying group, the Internet Association, as you mentioned, but not as forcefully as some advocates for the open web would have wanted to see. They wanted to see the Internet Association back um, the, this idea that uh, that net neutrality or that the Internet be regulated like a public utility, which would make it subject to far more regulation than it is now. Um, so John Oliver actually did a huge service in getting people uh, interested in this by renaming it. And it's something that I probably can't, it's probably not safe for me to say on, on Tech News Tonight the way he renamed it. Um, but it, it frames the debate as internet versus cable companies, um, which people seem to get really riled about um, for, for reasons that you can guess. And um, he, he did acknowledge that sort of net neutrality, those words in and of themselves, uh, the only words more boring in the English language than net neutrality are featuring sting, he says. <laughs> so so um, he did sting. a huge yeah, yeah, poor sting. Sorry, sting. <laughs> um, but I'm sure he's I'm sure he's not too too riled by this. And and John Oliver, for his part, um, got at least 20,000 more people to to comment. We, we saw um, spikes actually in traffic to the FCC commenting site following his broadcast and his 13 minute rant about net neutrality. So he definitely moved the needle and got people um, to understand the issue and frame the issue in a way that was a lot more palatable for folks. Now, shifting gears a little bit, the FCC is currently weighing a $45.2 billion proposal by Comcast to acquire Time Warner Cable. And if this is approved, the combined companies would control about 40% of the fixed broadband market in the United States. Already, some are slamming Comcast for acting like a monopoly after part of a customer service call to Comcast was recorded and posted online yesterday by former Engadget editor-in-chief and current AOL executive Ryan Block. You wrote about this on the NPR site. Uh, and Ryan Block was simply trying to cancel his Comcast service. Let's have a listen to a bit of this call. Okay, we'd like to, we'd like to disconnect. We'd like to disconnect, please. Okay, so why is it that you don't want the faster speed? Help me understand why you don't want faster internet. Help me understand why you can't just disconnect us. Because my job is to, ha is to have a conversation with you about having, about this, I mean, keeping your service. About finding out why it is that you're looking to cancel the service. I don't understand. Is this, is this okay, so you get the idea there. This, this went on for eight minutes, and this is the last eight minutes of an approximately 18-minute conversation. And, of course, uh, Ryan Block is a, a strong-willed person who knows what's going on in the world. You can imagine how that kind of, uh, you know, serious um, sort of sales tactic could actually work for a company like Comcast. Lots of people 
uh, may be taken in by that kind of thing and are too polite or too shy or whatever, easily pressured. Or just say, right, I give up, I surrender, right? Absolutely. So what was Comcast's response to the posting of this call? Obviously, this is a PR a nightmare for them. What did they say? They said they're very sorry and that they're contacting Mr. Block um, to personally apologize. They say they're for their investigating uh, exactly what happened. Um, they say this is actually not representative of how they train their employees. Um, but this has really struck a chord with the listening and the reading public. Um, after this posted, this has just really lit up the internet. Um, as of right now, I'm watching 24,000 concurrence on that post alone um, here at NPR.org. So it continues to really strike a chord with folks. Um, so Ryan Black can't be the only person who's ever experienced a customer service call that um, was as bleak and, and tedious as the one we just heard. Yeah, they're going to call Ryan Block and apologize to him and then ask him if he really wants to cancel his. <laughs> is he really sure about that? Now, is that a credible response? I mean, don't companies like this monitor calls to improve customer service? Wouldn't they know that this sort of thing is going on? Well, that's what a lot of our readers are saying. They're writing in and saying, like, this is exactly why they fear more mergers and, and more conglomeration by um, cable and, and telecommunications companies. Because as of right now, there's plenty of customers who say that that these companies aren't responsive to consumers as it is. So how, um, how could it get any better when they have even less competition? So this is an important question that's being raised. And the fact that there is so much concentrated interest in this call, I think, speaks to to this moment and, and and the fact that folks are fairly fed up um, with what's happening with their um, efforts to communicate with their cable and internet providers. Uh, Elise Hugh, I want to thank you for coming on Tech News tonight. Where can people find your work, including these two stories that we talked about? You can find me blogging at NPR.org. Uh, the blog I oversee is called All Tech Considered. All right. And we can also find you every Thursday on Tech News today at 10 a.m. Pacific. Thank you so much, Elise Hugh. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here. Google announced today the death of its ill-fated real names policy for Google+. When the social network was announced more than three years ago, Google's restrictions on what name you could use for your profile was really controversial. Many high-profile users who use pseudonyms professionally, it's not that uncommon, were actually banned from using their preferred names, and Google got a lot of bad press. The company later softened the policy, allowing pseudonyms on what Google calls plus pages, the kind of profile used by businesses, but not on personal pages. And when Google forced Google Plus logins on YouTube users, another big controversy erupted in part because YouTube users now had to theoretically use their actual names for the first time instead of commenting anonymously on YouTube with a pseudonym as they've been doing for years. One problem with the requirement for real names was that Google had no way to enforce it, and many Google Plus profiles clearly don't use real names. Today, Google finally announced that any user can use any name for their Google Plus profile without restriction. That's the right policy. It's just about three years too late. Well, that's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. You can subscribe to this show at twit.tv slash TN2 and write us at TN2 at twit.tv. Don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, tomorrow and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Mike Elgin. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.